morning and welcome to our service this morning. Happy Thanksgiving weekend. If you have a Bible and you'd like to follow along, we are in Paul's letter to the Colossians. We're in chapter 3. We're going to read verses 12 through 17, looking primarily at verses 15 through 17. Before we begin, let us pray. So Lord, once again, we do thank you for your word to us, for your goodness. Lord, for this Thanksgiving weekend, we are truly thankful today. I pray now as we look into the Holy Scriptures that you would lead us, guide us, and help us understanding, uh, understand what you're saying to us. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Okay, Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to in which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your heart to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. January 31st, 1957 is a historic date as it relates to the history of Thanksgiving Day in Canada. For on that date, the second Monday of October was permanently appointed to be observed as a day of general thanksgiving each year. It said, Whereas it hath pleased Almighty God in his great goodness to vouchsafe many blessings throughout the years to the people of Canada, we therefore, considering that these blessings vouchsafed to the people of Canada do call for a solemn and public acknowledgement, have thought fit by and with the advice of our Privy Council for Canada to appoint the second Monday in October in each and every year as a day of general thanksgiving. And we do hereby appoint the second Monday in October in the year of our Lord 1957 and each year thereafter as a day of general thanksgiving to Almighty God. To Almighty God for the blessings with which the people of Canada have been favored. And we do hereby invite all our people of Canada to observe the said day each year as a day of general thanksgiving. And while it's amazing that the Canadian government only 60 years ago has assigned a single day of the year for her citizens to give thanks, for the follower of Christ whose citizenship is in heaven, thanksgiving to God for his many blessings should be a way of life. It should be their ongoing experience and it should be that which flows naturally from their hearts, attitudes, and lips. In fact, a thankful heart should be one of the main characteristics that mark the life of a Christian. In other words, followers of Christ ought to live their lives with a spring in their step, with a song in their heart, and with the praise of God on their lips. 
I mean, they've been saved by grace. They've been given new life. They have peace with God. And since that's their present reality, their language, attitude, and demeanor ought to tell the story of what's happened in their hearts. Luke chapter 6, verse 43, Jesus said, For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces what? Good. And the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil. Here's the principle. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. So as it relates to our text in Colossians this morning, let's start with this. What does it mean to be thankful? When Paul says, be thankful in verse 15, have thankfulness in your hearts in verse 16, and give thanks to God the Father through him in verse 17, what does he mean? Because for the first century Christian living in Colossae, or for that matter, anywhere in Asia, life was extremely difficult. I mean, they couldn't just pretend in that day that everything was all right, because, because it wasn't. Life was hard. Pagan worship was everywhere. Immorality was accepted as being a normal part of life. And the cult of emperor worship was beginning to engulf the empire. Which means the Christ follower, the one determined to live a Christ-honoring life, would almost always cut against the grain of what was thought to be culturally normal. In other words, they stood out. They stood out like a sore thumb. So what does it mean to be thankful? Well, first, it means to show oneself grateful or to give thanks. It means to rejoice, to rejoice and be glad. It means the willful act of offering thanksgiving to God. You see, the Bible is filled with commands to give thanks. Psalm 106, verse 1, 107, verse 1, 118, verse 1, 1 Chronicles 16, verse 34, all say the very same thing. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Why? For he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. The psalmist writes in Psalm 100 verse 1, Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us. We are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. Why? Again, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. You see, singing songs of thanksgiving to God is about as ancient a practice as the scriptures themselves. In other words, the people of God have always been singing their praises to God, right from the very beginning. If we remember, Jesus led his disciples in a hymn following his final supper. From the way Paul speaks about the Christians, those gathering in Corinth, 
it appears that in his time, singing in the gathering was already a normal activity. He writes that when Christians gathered together, each of them had a psalm to sing. James encouraged his readers to sing songs of praise as well. And by the second century, the church historian Tertullian writes, after water for the hands and lights had been brought in, each is invited to sing to God, to sing to God in the presence of the others as he is able from his knowledge of the Holy Scriptures or from his own mind. All of this to say singing songs of thanksgiving, thanksgiving to God, well, it's our heritage. And not only is it our heritage, but it's our destiny as well. After all, worship is the language of heaven, of heaven itself. And so we sing, we sing to the Lord of heaven and earth. Again, the psalmist writes in Psalm 117, verse 1, Praise the Lord, all nations. Extol him, all peoples. For great is his steadfast love toward us. And the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Psalm 136, verse 1, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. For his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. For his steadfast love endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders. For his steadfast love endures forever. To him who by understanding made the heavens, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who spread out the earth above the waters, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who made the great lights, for his steadfast love endures forever. The sun to rule over the day, for his steadfast love endures forever. The moon and stars to rule over the night, for his steadfast love endures forever. The prophet Isaiah writes, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For the Lord God, he is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation, and you will say in that day, Give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let this be made known in all the earth. Shout and sing for joy. O inhabitant of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. Paul, writing to the Thessalonians, will write, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12, We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work, be at peace among yourselves. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Here it is. Give Thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. In other words, don't stop singing. 
Don't stop worshiping and don't ever stop giving thanks. Can you see the intentionality here? The excitement, energy, and exuberance. I mean, the psalmist, prophet, apostles, and even the early church are equally enthusiastic about the opportunity to worship Jesus, to join in the song of praise, to pray without ceasing, and to give thanks to the Lord of heaven and earth. And the intentionality here must not be overlooked, must not be missed, because what it means is this. Believers in Christ have made the conscious choice or the conscious decision to be thankful. In other, words, in other words, they've thought about it. They've reasoned it out and have come to the conclusion that yes, Jesus Christ is Lord of all and he alone is worthy of our praise. Earlier in his letter to the Colossians, Paul wrote, since you are men and women of Christ, since you've said goodbye to your old way of life, be sure that you've done away with everything that characterized that old life. For you have died with Christ, were buried with Christ, and one day by the power of the Holy Spirit, you'll be raised to Christ. Therefore, church, act, speak, Think and do life in the new and living way as you abide in Christ with thanksgiving in your heart. In other words, be who you are. I mean, if you're in Christ, you are a child of God. If you're in Christ, you've received the spirit of adoption as sons and daughters of God. If you're in Christ, you've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. You've been called out of darkness into his marvelous light. You've been set free. You've been chosen. You've been sealed by the Holy Spirit. You belong to Christ. Colossians 3.1 If then you have been raised with Christ, if you're a believer, if you're a Christian, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them. But now, now that you're a believer, now that you're a Christian, now that you're a follower of Christ, put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Colossians 3.15 And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, here it is, and be thankful. The peace of Christ is different from any other so-called peace. Before he died, Jesus, with his disciples gathered around, said this, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world 
gives do I give to you. You see, Christ gives his people peace, what he calls my peace or his personal peace. And this peace, which thankfully isn't dependent on outward circumstances, creates the stability of heart, the courage and the determination to continue moving forward despite present difficulties. In other words, the peace that Jesus gives is the deep sense of belonging, meaning in life, and the satisfaction of a soul which results in genuine thankfulness. And so because of Christ and what he has done, we are thankful. We're thankful because no longer are we in a state of hostility with God. We're thankful because through Christ, our aching, broken hearts have been satisfied. And even more, he's allowed us to fulfill our purpose and meaning. You see, we were created by God, for God, and it's only through God that our hearts can ever find true fulfillment. And the peace of Christ, which ultimately settles our hearts, the peace which surpasses all understanding, ought to be what rules our hearts and governs our lives. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, Paul writes, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to do what? To walk or do life in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Rita Snowden tells the story of a strong-willed woman who had such a vile temper that she was known as Warrior Brown. She was often belligerent and became enraged whenever she got drunk. People and dogs alike had got out of her way when her temper flared. She was always ready for a fight. Then one day, she was converted. She became a Christian. Her entire life was wonderfully changed by the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. A little group of Salvation Army folk had come to her to her district and she listened to their preaching and decided, she decided to follow Christ. Weeks passed and people hadn't noticed her drunk, nor had her temper flared of late. One night she was speaking at an open air meeting, telling of the change that Christ had brought to her life. It was a rather unruly meeting and someone at the edge of the crowd began throwing things at her and a potato struck her a nasty blow. In the old days, that would have been a dangerous thing to do. However, Warrior Brown calmly picked up the potato and without a word put it in her pocket. Months went by and then the harvest Thanksgiving service was held. People assembled, bringing their thank offerings, and along came Warrior Brown with a little bag of potatoes. And she explained that she had planted the insulting potato that had one day struck her in the face. And she had planted it and was bringing to God the fruit of her planting. You see, the peace that comes by Christ through Christ and from Christ, creates in a person a genuine heart of thanksgiving to God, which is further enhanced as the scriptures are studied, which means when the word of God is taught, thought, and applied, as it begins to dwell richly within us, we're going to want to sing to God all the more. We're going to even be more excited about Christ and what he's done, what he's done in our lives. 
what Paul says here in Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, here it is, with thanksgiving in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything. Do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks. Giving thanks to God the Father through Him. You see, as believers in Christ, Thankfulness to God ought to be our default position. It ought to be where we stand regardless of our situation or our circumstance. We certainly see this in the lives of Paul and Silas as they lay beaten and bruised in the Philippian jail. Chained to the wall in painful contorted positions. They willfully and willingly chose or choose to worship and sing. They chose to give thanks to the Lord God of heaven who had done so very much for them. And their songs of gratitude, their songs of worship, their songs of praise changed a man. Changed a man and his entire family. And changed to a degree an entire city, the city of Philippi. In preparing this message, I thought I'd do a little bit of an exercise, something interesting, I thought. You see, the letter to the Colossians is really a letter all about Jesus Christ, about what he did about what he was doing and about what he was going to do, going to do in these believers' lives. And so what I did is I started in chapter 1, continued through chapter 2 and into chapter 3, highlighting everything about Jesus. And let me say this list is extensive and absolutely glorious. And what I want to do this morning is read the list, the list that Paul wrote to the Colossian believers in the hope that his words about Christ, what he's done, might encourage you and I today. You see, whether we realize it or not, we too have so much to be thankful for. So much to, be, uh, to sing about and plenty of reasons to worship Jesus. Because he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. Chapter 1, verse 13. Because in him we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. Verse 14, he is the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn of all creation. Because by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. Because he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. In him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you, to present you holy and blameless, and above reproach 
before him. In him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. You have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith, in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespass and the uncircumcision of your heart, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. You have died. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. We've got so much to be thankful for. The question is, are we? Are we thankful? Are the praises of God on our lips? Are we excited to worship? Because for the believer, that's what thankfulness really is. In fact, thankfulness to God for his many benefits, his many blessings, ought to be the inner and outer demeanor of every Christ follower. Where a genuine heartfelt joy wells up within us to overflowing because of what God has done for us. Which means regardless of our present circumstance, however difficult, painful, or glorious, we worship Jesus. We worship him for who he is. Lord of heaven and earth, the first and the last, the beginning and the end the Savior of our soul. You see, thankfulness brings Christ fame, keeps us humble as well. And it also directs our hearts toward God. And while giving thanks to Almighty God once a year is certainly a commendable thing, we who believe in Jesus must do so without ceasing, for that is, that is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you and for me. 1 Chronicles 29, verse 11, we'll close with this. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you. We thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. My prayer for you is that you would know Christ, know the power of his name, know his salvation intimately, personally, and that you, with a thankful heart, might worship Jesus each and every day. So let's pray. So Lord, we do thank you once again for your word to us. I pray, Lord, that in this time of trouble, we would take courage, that we would take heart, that we'd be um, even joyful with the opportunity that we have in this time to glorify you. 
Lord, I pray that you would give us whatever it is that it takes to continue building your church in whatever place we happen to be. Lord, use us for your kingdom building that you might receive much honor and glory in our time. So Lord, I just pray a special blessing on each one that is listening. And I pray, Lord, that these words would encourage all of us to smile, to rejoice, keep moving forward in Christ. And it's in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. All right, well, blessings on you. We will see you next week and have a great week.